professor, Jeff Williams, went in search of the real story of why, for most of the past three decades, the movie could only be found twice a year on NBC. It's a convoluted story, but Sheldon Abend was a literary agent. And he's watching TV one day, and he sees this movie, and he gets really mad. He represents Cornell Woolrich, who wrote a short story that the movie Rear Window was based on. It was called uh, It Had to Be Murder. Cornell Woolrich died in 1968. And Sheldon is like, this is wrong. I run Cornell's estate. I should be getting this money. He takes it to court, and it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And they rule in Sheldon Aben's favor. They're like, yeah, you should have gotten money for Rear Window. Sheldon Aben and this 1990 Supreme Court decision would, in fact, have no direct legal bearing on the wonderful life situation. But the widespread misunderstanding that it did will have an impact on the story. Uh, more on that later. First, a quick refresher is probably helpful here. Uh, you'll remember the short story, The Greatest Gift, on which Wonderful Life was based, was written by Philip Van Doren Stern before work on the movie itself began. Uh, you met his granddaughter, Laura Robinson, in the first episode. I'll bring you closer to Philip and his family in future episodes. Failing to find a publisher for his independent story, Philip copyrighted it in 1943 and sent it out with 200 Christmas cards, interesting RKO Studios, and eventually Frank Capra. Scripts were written by other parties under contract to RKO and later Frank for what became Wonderful Life. After Wonderful Life failed to meet expectations at the box office in 1947, Banks threatened to foreclose on its director, Frank Capra, who was forced to sell his independent company, Liberty Films, and its movie, Wonderful Life, to the movie studio, Paramount. Less than a decade later, Paramount resold it to National Telefilm Associates, NTA, whom you learned about in an earlier episode. They, and their legal team, led by Rashida Jones' grandfather, overlooked renewing the copyright of Wonderful Life in 1974. And thereafter, the public perception became that anyone could do anything they wanted with the movie. In 1984, former Wonderful Life copyright holder NTA essentially merged with a former movie studio and changed its name to Republic Pictures. And then comes one summer day in 1993, and just over three years after that Supreme Court ruling I mentioned. Jeffrey Baker of Good Times Home Video receives a letter, much like the letters that around 200 others across America are receiving at this time. He opens it. The law offices of James P. Tierney, 100 Wilshire Boulevard, 12th floor, Santa Monica, California, 90401. June 10th. 1993. Dear Mr. Baker, We have learned that you may have been exploiting the motion picture entitled It's a Wonderful Life. If you have been exploiting the film in any media, you have been violating my client's rights under the copyright laws of the United States. The above-referenced music publishers own all of the copyrighted music in the film, and Republic is the exclusive licensee of the right to copy and exploit the music in the film. Further, the film is based upon the separately copyrighted literary work by Philip Van Doren Stern, entitled The Greatest Gift. Republic owns the exclusive rights to exploit the story as embodied in the film during the renewal term of copyright in the story. We understand that the copyright in the film as a derivative work was not renewed and, as a result, any new matter added to the separately copyrighted musical compositions and the story in order to create the film is apparently unprotected by copyright in the United States of America, its territories, and commonwealths. However, copyright nonetheless exists for the musical compositions and story used in the film because their respective copyrights were timely renewed. As the United States Supreme Court recently stated, the use of copyright works in the creation of a derivative work does not limit or impair the exclusive rights granted by copyright law to the proprietors of the underlying works. Los Angeles Times, November 23rd, 1993. Company Town, you will wish less wonderful life, tune in. Over the next month, you'll see what a holiday season's like without its wonderful life airing nonstop on television. It's wonderful life stopped being freely available for broadcast as a result of the Supreme Court decision in 1990, upholding the rights of the owner of a short story on which Alfred Hitchcock based his rare window thriller. 
That caused Republic Pictures, which had assumed It's a Wonderful Life was in the public domain, to look closely at the rights it held to The Greatest Gift, an obscure short story by Philip Van Doren Stern, on which Capra loosely based his film. Bolstered by a U.S. Supreme Court decision, lawyers are now succeeding at doing what the film's mis- evil Mr. Potter always wished he could do, bring in the dailies. There are some factual errors within this Los Angeles Times reporting by Jim Bates that you just heard, the result of Jim's direct conversations with people inside Republic. Just before Thanksgiving, 1993, Jim learns of the letters that have gone out and heads to Republic's offices in Beverly Hills to find out what exactly is going on. He meets with Russell Goldsmith, its CEO, who makes clear he believes his company is losing millions they might otherwise be making from Wonderful Life. I knew Russell, you know, because part of my beat was covering film companies, and I know I'd met with Russell and met with a a couple of times and got to know them. I also covered Blockbuster as a, as a company, and, you know, they made investment in Republic. So, you know, I got to know Russell. I actually asked him Russell's father, um, well, too, his father, I, I previously, prior to covering entertainment, you know, covering banking, and Russell's father, Bram, uh, was the head of City National Bank, uh, which was the bank to the stars in Hollywood. Russell later, after leaving Republic, ran City National for a number of years and just retired. With the 50th anniversary of Wonderful Life approaching, and with Blockbuster purchasing a stake in Republic, and a merger with Aaron's Spelling Entertainment on the table, Goldsmith is looking for ways to increase the value of Republic, which will sweeten the proposition of acquisition by a bigger fish. He turns to corporate attorney James Tierney. Wouldn't it be nice for them if they could regain control of wonderful life? They hatch a plan, as they explain to Jim. I want to make showings of wonderful life rare enough that the networks will be eager enough to air it during the holidays and make a deal out of it. I'm sure that's something that he told me. I'm sure they've asked, why do you want to do this? You know, he would have said, look, you know, here's what we'd like to do. And, you know, we've had this idea that we could maybe make a, like, you have it as a special release on video and have it as a primetime special. And so, yeah, we're not going to let all these stations air it. You know, we're sitting at the season of these letters. Tierney, the Republic lawyer, tells Jim, We're trying to resolve this without filing 200 lawsuits. We would resolve all of them, but we'd like to win this amicably first. Jim wonders... If Republic has story rights to The Greatest Gift or any other story rights that would allow them to control showings of the movie Wonderful Life now, why have they not asserted those rights earlier? The answer to that one is never made totally clear to Jim. Uh, But Republic has also gone out and purchased rights to songs written before Wonderful Life was made that were used in the soundtrack. Any local station airing the movie, with the soundtrack embedded under every scene, would seem to be violating Republic's newly acquired license to the music, regardless of whether the movie itself is or is not in the public domain. My recollection is buying the music rights was the key element. It wasn't so much as saying we own, you know, because if they theoretically own the rights from, you know, ever since Cynthia has failed to renew it, if they still owned it, they theoretically could have tried to invoke it then. But obviously they felt, you know, let's get the, you know, get the music rights. And that's what kind of put it over the top. I I imagine there was some bit of uncertainty uh, involved in terms of, is that enough to to accomplish what you want to accomplish? Having the rights to the short story and the music. The music was was a pretty clever thing to do. Because then, as he pointed out, you have two things there. You also own the negative, but you know you have two things there that you can use to try to enforce this. Those two elements, Republic's vaguely stated rights to story related to Wonderful Life and their acquisition of the music, are characterized by lawyer Tierney to Jim as two barrels of a shotgun. Jeff Williams again. You've got all these small TV stations and they don't have deep pockets. You know, you're not going to go to courts for the right to show this one movie for free at Christmas. I mean, I don't think there was one actual court case. James Tierney basically just threatened a lot of lawsuits and all these stations said, oh, okay, okay, we won't won't show it. And now they've got it. 
And, you know, maybe it is theirs, maybe it's not. Republic and uh, the corporations that acquire Republic and NBC go on to make millions from Wonderful Life over the next three decades, thanks to Tierney. Now, Tierney is an interesting fellow. While helping Republic in their effort to regain control of Wonderful Life, he was also working on another little operation for another client. The Los Angeles Times ex-prosecutor charged in art fraud case. A former federal prosecutor has been charged in a case that underscores the potential for fraud in the complex world of fine art insurance. James P. Tierney, who worked as a federal prosecutor in New York and Los Angeles before entering private practice, aided one of his clients in a conspiracy to fake the theft of works by Picasso and Monet and defraud two insurance companies, according to a document federal prosecutors filed in the U.S. District Court in Los Angeles. Tierney, who became a prominent entertainment lawyer, bases one count of aiding and abetting wire fraud. His attorney said Tierney will cooperate in the federal investigation of Stephen G. Cooperman, a retired ophthalmologist. It is a little bit like a like a Tarantino movie in that you, you have these kind of like really uh, kind of outrageous characters. Jeff Leeds is also a Los Angeles Times reporter in the 1990s, covering the media industry, when he takes an interest in the James Tierney art fraud case. This doctor named Stephen Cooperman, in the course of becoming fairly wealthy, um, became an, a pretty avid art collector. So what government essentially say uh, initially is that Cooperman and some co-conspirators had arranged to have the paintings stolen so that he could file, you know, what he knew would be a fraudulent claim. So I don't really know um, how or when they became friends. Um, but but Tierney, you know, was a Tierney was a, a, a certainly successful um, entertainment lawyer in his own right, um, and in in various cases, it represented people like Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys, actors like Timothy Hutton, and others. I never would have imagined that the the Cooperman case and the the Tierney case would be connected to It's a Wonderful Life. Tierney was charged ultimately by the government with his role in this sort of conspiracy to steal the artwork from Cooperman's home and file the false insurance claims. He cooperated in the investigation of Cooperman. Tierney said, you know, in retrospect, he felt like this was a terrible mistake and that as as Cooperman's friend, he should have gotten Cooperman to take responsibility for the, the difficult financial situation that he'd gotten himself into. And he said, I didn't help my friend take responsibility. And that's a mistake that I'll be paying for for a long time. The government had recordings of, of Tierney speaking with Cooperman about the uh, sort of conspiracy to to disappear the the paintings. In these recordings, he actually suggests to Tierney that they destroy the paintings with uh, with garden clippers. And Tierney uh, doesn't that, that doesn't happen. Tierney suggests that they actually return the paintings to the insurance companies. And Cooperman says to him, uh, sleeping dogs are best left sleeping. The paintings were found in the storage locker of Tierney's one-time law partner, James Little, who claimed to prosecutors he had brought them to Cleveland unknowingly at the behest of Tierney. Little's name, by the way, uh, can also be found at the top of those cease and desist letters that went out to TV stations in 1993 on behalf of Republic. Justice Department lawyers later alleged that Tierney also had been providing illegal kickbacks in an unrelated case. <laughs> uh, for the insurance fraud case, the man who managed to get Republic control of Wonderful Life was convicted and sentenced to eight months in jail, surrendering his legal license. It's a Wonderful Life is really about this question of what if and what happened if an individual person was not around. And I think that's a, a close relative of another question, um, which I think Tierney asked, which was what what would have happened if I had just made different decisions? Yeah, I mean, I think there there obviously is a is a, you know, a sort of morality tale here. And as we said, I think that in the same way that the movie through fiction uh, asks us to to question what is our value? What is our place here? What can we contribute? And what would happen if we weren't around? You know, I think the the real story, the actual story of Tierney and this uh, this friend of his is about, I guess, what happens if we were to make different and better decisions. At the time this was going on, you know, Tierney was kind of representing Republic and in and, uh, and trying to sort of regain control of what they probably knew was a, a really lucrative title to have. 
in situations like this and uh in a sense um I, you know i don't know if, if people would draw this parallel but but it, in a certain way you know you could sort of say that the the studio is almost acting as the as the potter here and trying to prevent the little guy from making use of uh this genuine and kind of and heartfelt story it's time to say if, if t- never achieves escape philosophy as it were The rear window ruling involved copyright renewal in an underlying story after the author of the story had died. So this did not pertain to Wonderful Life. As you'll remember, the author of The Greatest Gift, Philip, did renew the copyright to his story while alive. But in its ruling, the Avent case made crystal clear that a derivative film is tethered, using Peter's terminology, to the story on which it's based. A derivative film's copyright covers only those elements of the film original to the filmmakers. The rest of the elements of a derivative film, all those elements original to the underlying story, are protected by copyright in the underlying story. The facts that are the facts of It's a Wonderful Life. But it, the decision was clear enough in its implications so that it set the scene for a public and then paramount strategy with respect to recapturing control of It's a Wonderful Life. But I think it's probable that between 1990 and For the next decade or so, the Republic Paramount claim that that because it was the successor in interest to the the Stern family's rights in the greatest gift story, it could control who could broadcast It's a Wonderful Life and When had some merit. If you have been exploiting the film in any media, you have been violating my client's rights under the copyright laws of the United States. Then Republic and its successors have been taking the position that based on their transferred interests in the story rights, they are entitled to license um, not only new productions, but also in particular uh, broadcasts and uh, and showings of the film itself. So presumably, they still have those rights. If the Van Dorns gave a new grant to Republic, maybe Republic just went to them and asked for a quit claim, said, you know, if you've still got any rights in this, you know, we'll, you know, give them to us and we'll pay you a modest amount of money. They could have done that. Paramount, which, as you'll remember, acquired Republic, certainly seems to believe they still hold some form of rights beyond music. 2013. An independent company announces they plan to proceed with a sequel to Wonderful Life, stating publicly that this is based on their assumption the movie is in the public domain. On Monday, Florida-based Star Partners, a film financing entity, and Nashville-based Hummingbird Productions, which is one of the biggest producers of music for commercials, announced they were teaming up for a sequel to the classic film It's a Wonderful Life. The producers had lined up Carolyn Grimes, who played George Bailey's daughter Zuzu in the original film, to reprise her role as Zuzu, now an angel as she visits Bailey's grandson, who is far from perfect. Hummingbird's Bob Farnsworth says the rights to Wonderful Life were in the public domain, and that he had written a screenplay with Martha Bolton, a former staff writer on Bob Hope specials. But now Paramount says, not so fast. A studio spokesman told us, No project relating to It's a Wonderful Life can proceed without a license from Paramount. To date, these individuals have not obtained any of the necessary rights, and we would take all appropriate steps to protect those rights. So, it appears for now anyway, that Paramount intends to continue forcefully asserting that it holds the power over this movie. Their music rights would not allow, in this 2013 instance, an ability to challenge a sequel. So they seem to be asserting a claim to copyright in the underlying story, The Greatest Gift. They don't have copyright in the story, and they've never come to us for copyright in the story. The only people who have ever held copyright in the story, The Greatest Gift, are my grandfather, Philip, 
his heirs, his only daughter and his three granddaughters, my mother and my two sisters and me, and the small family company that we heirs created to hold and manage the greatest gift copyright. Sarah Robinson, here to clarify matters. She's one of those three granddaughters of Philip Van Doren Stern, and really among the only people on earth who can clarify all of this. Regarding any story rights held by Republic and now Paramount, she says, You know, to hold copyright in something is to hold a whole bunch or bundle of exclusive rights in that thing. In 1944, when my grandfather sold the movie rights to his story, the rights to make movies from the story and TV and some limited radio, he didn't sell the copyright in the story or any of the other rights in the bundle. He held on to copyright and those other rights. That 1944 agreement was very specific in describing the movie, TV, and limited radio rights he was selling. And the agreement also stated plainly that my grandfather held the copyright in the story. In fact, the agreement required him to renew the copyright when the time came, which he did, of course. My grandfather made this agreement in 1944 with a Hollywood agent named Frank Vincent. Vincent transferred the agreement to RKO, which turned it over to Frank Capra. And in 1946, Frank Capra used the 1944 agreement, the movie rights in the 1944 agreement, to make It's a Wonderful Life. At some point after that, both the movie and the 1944 rights agreement made their way to NTA, and of course NTA failed to renew copyright in the movie. NTA later changed its name to Republic. And in the 1990s, when Republic made its claims about rights it held in the story, All Republic had for rights in the story were those same rights that Capra had had back in 1946, those 1944 rights to make motion pictures of the story and TV and limited radio. Republic didn't have copyright in the story or any other rights in the story's copyright bundle. My grandfather never let go of that copyright, except when he died and passed it on to us, his heirs, via his will. So all those times that Tierney and Republic said, or implied, they held copyright to the story, it was always held by Philip and his heirs and them alone? In that case, Tierney's two-barreled shotgun would have had at least one empty, the story rights. And had some enterprising person back in the early 1990s been able to strip the soundtrack of those popular songs Republic had licensed and simply replace them, Well, uh, Tierney may well have ended up totally unarmed. Just imagine that alternative universe. Would the Republic and Aaron Spelling merger have gone forward? With that nice little promotion for Russell Goldsmith? Would Republic have still enticed sales with Blockbuster and Viacom? And what about NBC? Without Wonderful Life to build its holiday programming around so effectively... Interesting to think about, isn't it? And another thing, this isn't about copyright to the greatest gift, because as I've said, copyright's always been held by Philip or his heirs. But it's interesting. The copyright law allows authors of works copyrighted before 1978 to terminate or take back grants of rights they've made after 56 years have passed. And if an author dies before 56 years passed, the author's heir gets that right to terminate. So 56 years after my grandfather granted out those 1944 rights to make movies, TV, and limited radio from his story, my mother, his heir, terminated that 1944 grant. That was in 2000. And the upshot of this is that in 2000, Republic lost the rights it had held in The Greatest Gift, namely those movie, TV, and limited radio rights. My mother got those rights back, and she placed them into our small family company. But... In the Potter-dominated corporate America of today, do the actual legalities make any difference? Or is it about the 